Testing. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out to our annual town hall meeting. I'm sorry about that. I will turn, uh, let the record show that all council members are present except council member Adams and council member Alvarez. And I will now turn the uh, meeting over to our city manager, Ken Cagle. Thank you. Thank everyone for being here. As you know, a couple of years ago, the council added to their uh, governing standards an annual special workshop, and it is to um, hold a special workshop or town hall specifically designed to explain the mission, vision, direction, special projects for the city, be held annually around October. And uh, so that's why we're here today. We've got an agenda, and uh, the mayor's going to start off with making a presentation, and then there'll be opportunity for any uh, of the council members to have any follow-up they would like to or comments that are on the agenda that they would like to make, and then it'll be open to the public to make comments on the issues that have been brought up or those that are on the agenda. And we also have uh, three presentations. Um, one from Chief Kabinsky on the EO, EOC and Station 4 update, um, our city engineer Andrew Zagers on road construction update, and Chief Lopez on the real-time uh, crime center technology update. Mayor? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cagle, for that introduction. And thank you all once again for coming out uh, this afternoon to be a part of our town hall meeting. And it's very important to me because I'm really big on community engagement, and that's our positive community culture. And what we have to do and council have been doing, we leave our jobs or homes or I leave out of the office and we'll go out into the community. And the reason that we do this, we want to stay engaged. And our city is so diverse that you can go to any type of of event and learn about a different culture. So to me, that is very important that we stay engaged with our community because some individuals will not be able to attend these meetings. So they may look at it on television, but when you're out there in the public eye and you're engaging with the community, you get to hear from the individuals that we don't see or the individuals that do not have access to email or the internet. So it's very important for this council to stay engaged with the community. And that's a big thing for me, community outreach. So all of, most of my slides is about all the great things that the council and the city staff under the leadership of our city manager, Mr. Cagle, have done, especially in the downtown uh, clean area because I believe that every city should have a vibrant, vibrant downtown. And that's what we're doing now under the leadership of Ms. Kate. She's our downtown revitalization director and she has done a tremendous job. So the slides that are before you, the first one with the word Colleen, uh, local artists went downtown, the first one and the last one, and they did some murals and they also painted on the streets. And that's bringing that boom. We're trying to revitalize it so we have to give it a different flavor. And so uh, local community artists went and uh, helped and assist with just making our city even better downtown. What's important to me is in the middle. Those are our six big ideals, and that's part of our Colleen 2040 comprehensive plan. And for those that do not know what it is, uh, two years ago, well, we, we're implementing it now, 
but we sent out surveys, we talked to stakeholders, we also talked to business owners, uh, the educational system, anyone that wanted to give an input on how they wanted to see the city of Killeen grow within the next 20 years. So all department heads, they gave their input, and anything that happened downtown Killeen, it's just not the downtown Killeen committee. Each department has played a major part by lending their staff to participate with our cleanup and everything that happens downtown it requires police officers, firefighters, park and rec, public works. It also include, include you may not believe it, the finance department because the opera funding that went, goes downtown. So each department has to play a part in revitalizing our downtown Colleen area. So we had our touchdown in downtown Colleen event, which is our second year right now. We had it in September. And also what's important to me, under the leadership, as I stated earlier, Mrs. K, we have 80% of our buildings already occupied. Okay, that's good, that's good. Okay, that's really good. It's, and that has happened within 12 months. And $9 million of private investment of the business owners and 37 new businesses is opening in the area. So the OPA money has gone, the $9.7 million has gone toward revitalizing our downtown. And I'm really, truly appreciative of this council that make the hard decisions and know the value of our downtown Colleen area and also the residents that live in that area. They put in the work and now we're going to receive the fruits from it. So I'm very, very excited about that. Also, we have six new public art installations, 22 events that was hosted in our downtown area, historical downtown. We have our market night on Friday night. You might want to go down there because I think it ends November, if I'm not third, I think, November 3rd. It ends. Thank you, Miss Kate, for giving me the nod. And also, Lavallis Hamilton. He works with the city manager office. Well, now he's been moved to development service under our executive director, Mr. Revell. And he and his staff, which is Kay, uh, they work together, uh, which they don't work for each other either way. They just work together to host all of these events downtown. And we have a big turnout. So if you have not had the opportunity to go to our downtown events, I challenge you to at least go to one. You will love it. And we have 15 of our historical buildings that have been re renovated. So there are a lot of great things that's going on downtown. Just walk around. I'm not going to be before you long. I just want to highlight a couple more things. So what have we completed within our Colleen 2040 comprehensive plan? We have a permanent public police substation downtown. It's already been established. The concern was I don't want to go downtown because of crime. Well, we have a solution. So please visit our downtown area, and it's our engagement unit. And what makes them so significant is that they engage with the business owners downtown, the residents that attend our community events, and they do so much to ensure that our downtown area is safe. And I enjoy going downtown. So we have vibrant neighborhoods. The council did an overhauling of our designs and our construction standards, which is good because our neighborhoods, uh, we should not have subdivisions, but we should have neighborhoods. And to me, that means everything has to have a connectivity. And connectivity means when I go outside of my house, I should be able to go down a walking trail, take my dog to a dog park. I'll go around the corner and I'm at a coffee shop, pick up my cleaners, get my hair done. You know, you want those uh, amenities that are convenient for you once you invest in the home. So we think that's important also. And also we have updated our transportation. Uh, we adopted a new thoroughfare plan. We updated the regulations um, for shared youth paths and sidewalks, and we updated the standards to reduce maintenance and construction costs. And that's all the departments 
doing their fair share. And we have a great, great staff that works in City Hall, but also our executive directors and their employees go beyond to ensure that the highest quality of life has been given to our residents. We thank our first responders, as you know, our fire department and police department are the first ones on the line. And every day and night, they're out there protecting us so we can be safe. And we are truly blessed to have a great team. So what do I need from you? I need you to go to www.colleentexas.gov slash Colleen2040 and read our comprehensive plan. And when you read it, learn about our big ideals and how our city is moving forward in the next 20 years. And then you can also see on that website how we have progressed. And I cannot leave without uh, stating this because of communication. The communication director wanted me to ensure that you stay involved and you want to receive our alerts. So if you get your phone out, if you have time, or you can just go on, on our website, www.colleentexas.gov, and you will get the alerts when there's bore water notice, when there's a road closure, about our community events, and also about our council meetings. So any way you want to be connected to the city of Colleen and know what's going on in Colleen, we have provided that resource for you. With that being said, thank you. Well, if, um, Council, if you want to make any comments or would you rather hear the uh, presentations first? Presentation. All right, Chief Kaminsky. All right, uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Manager, members of the City Council, and most importantly, to our citizens for our Town Hall. Uh, this is an exciting update, uh, especially as we just went out to bid this past Monday for a project we've been working on for the last two years. And uh, a brief review and update on where we were, where we're at, and where we're going. In uh, late 2020, 2021, uh, we, funding was approved for expansion of the Clean Fire Department through two sources, some ARPA funding, and that was for an emergency operations center, a support building, and a training complex. Our, uh, we, we don't have any emergency operations center, to be honest. Currently, we utilize the training academy. Uh, it utilizes the training academy Monday through Friday, and should we have an emergency, some sort of a natural disaster, we shut down the academy, we clear it out, we stand up an emergency operations center that would probably take us somewhere in the area of six to eight hours to get stood up. Uh, our support services building is right down the street here on Avenue D. That building was built in the 1950s and uh, currently is uh, at the end of its service life to be quite honest. And then our training complex. We have no training tower for the, the City of Colleen Fire Department uh, for live fire training. They have utilized three Connex boxes that were constructed about 10 years ago, and they make it work, so we do get some live fire training, but it is not something that was built to be a live fire training tower. And then the ninth fire station. This fire department has grown, and especially in the south central part of the city, there are some response time areas that need a little bit of work. So our Emergency Operations Center and Support Training Complex will provide training to the Clean Fire Department personnel as well as other city employees on how to respond to a declared emergency. So you're going to hear Chief Lopez speak a little bit later about a real crime, time crime center. That's different than the Emergency Operations Center. The Emergency Operations Center gets stood up when an emergency is declared by the mayor. And it also allows for enhanced response to that declared emergency as well as our routine emergency incidents as well. The new fire station is going to improve our response times, also maintain our insurance services office rating. We are an ISO class one rated agency right now. Less than 5% of agencies in the country are ISO class one rated. And what does that relate to you as citizens is your insurance bill for your house homeowners insurance. If we were downgraded to a ISO class two rating, you would see somewhere in the range of a seven to 10% increase in your insurance premiums for your hazard insurance for your home. 
And then the new fire station will also improve response times uh, and add much needed resources to the fire department. Currently, our fire department runs 29,000 calls a year out of eight firehouses. And some of our ambulances especially are taxed uh, at a, a level that um, is just below that line of where we need to add more resource, resources. As you take a look at this map here on your right or left, if you see the map with the green, you'll see that there's that area that is blank. That's the area that we need the new fire station. When we did our master plan uh, a couple of years ago, they took and overlaid a potential station along the area of Tremere and Kelly Road. And by taking our call responses in that area, you see the red star that's over there that um, would look like what uh, the response times would be. We would reduce our response times from eight minutes down to our acceptable six minute time by placing a fire station somewhere in the Tremere Road and Kelly Road area, which is just south of the Technology Center for Clean ISD. So we were able to identify a piece of land with our partners with KISD uh, just in front of the, the Tremere um, Sheridan Transportation Facility. And we're able to purchase that land. That's what's happened over the last couple of years. We identified that property, began discussions in early 2022 to be able to purchase some acreage that they identified as surplus. Then we completed all those processes that were needed to purchase just over 13.9 acres located at what is now addressed as 9200 Tremere Road. That purchase was completed just this past April and that land purchase process we learned was time consuming. There are a lot of steps that go into two government entities uh, agreeing on getting land switched and uh, agreed upon purchase. And then of course the process of city council meetings and things like that. Fast forward to September 2022, or actually let's go back a little bit. So we got the land purchase in April, but we wanted to be cognizant of time to move this process forward. So back in September of last year, we went out to RFQ for an architectural firm to start the design process because we knew that we didn't need to have the land to start the design process. We had honed in on it. We had found some land. We could start designing though, even though we hadn't officially purchased the land. And so we had about, uh, 10 companies that submitted proposals for the project. We submitted Martinez Architects in November of 2022. And I'll be uh, honest, I was very happy that they submitted an aggressive design schedule from their team, which helped minimize the effects of monthly rise in construction costs. We, we know that construction costs are rising. Uh, good the news, they've stabilized, but they have not started to go down again, unfortunately. I know this is some small print, but the long and short of it is in May of 2023 is when they started after we went to contract, got city council approval for their contract, got everything signed. And we are anticipating April of 2025, closing out the project and opening up fire station four with the emergency operations center support building and training tower. And here's a first look of the concept. We have a lot more and the next, I'm done with words now, it's all pictures, just like firefighters like it. Um, here are some concepts that the design team have provided, and this is what has been put out in the bid package. So if you look at the top of the screen, that is a three-story fire training tower, a true fire training tower where our firefighters and the cadets that come through our fire training academy can actually get some real live fire training experience, not just in a Connex box that was welded to two other Connex boxes. The building that is in the middle to the left is a fire department support services building. Currently, all of our reserve fire trucks, and these fire trucks cost about $900,000 to purchase. Ambulances, $450,000. Ladder trucks, $1.9 million. And they last about 20 years. It's a good lifespan. They're expensive, but we get a good lifespan. But currently, our storage is outside in the parking lot behind Central Station. That's not where we should be storing these highly valuable pieces of equipment that need to function. So we're going to have an indoor storage facility along with where we keep our bunker gear, where we keep generators for air conditioners for the ambulances. And then if you look to the front, that's a, a concept that uh, Martinez Architects and a number of construction firms have already started um, calling us and asking us, where did you come up with this concept? We've never seen anything like it before. To combine a fire station with a training academy and an EOC, they've never seen anything. Usually a public safety campus is an EOC, a fire department administration, a support building, it's all the ancillary things, but they've never seen a fire station actually built into 
the EOC. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that and already starting to generate some buzz in Texas and a couple of other states of where did that idea come from. The idea, idea came from being responsible with taxpayer dollars and how could we get the best bang for our buck. And it was with a good partnership with Martinez Architects who said, because we had thought about one story building spanning out and they said, hey, concrete's pretty expensive right now. I says, well, why can't we build a two story then? Is it cheaper? They says, yes. I says, well, let's just attach the fire station to it. I says, you want to do that? I says, yeah, why not? So it was a really cool concept. Uh, so that's the, the overlay. And now we're going to take a walk around from the front. So this is if you're standing at Tremere Road, the front of the building. Again, it's a feature piece for the city of Colleen. And that's what we're really excited about. Make no mistake about what you're going to be looking at when you drive by. You're going to see a big old number four. Just so you know, it's the ninth fire station. Colleen Fire Station 4 used to be at Skylark Field when it was a commercial uh, airline operating uh, airfield. When they moved over to the new airfield, Gray Army Airfield and Fort Cavazos Fire took over the airport firefighting duties because their station is right there. And they just, as they built other stations, when they closed down Station 4, never renumbered something. So it was really my OCD part of me saying we need to just have a complete number. I can't skip the number four. So that's why we're calling it number four. Uh, so this is a two-story building. The right side of the building, you see the bays for the fire station. And then to the left side of where you see that fire truck on the first floor is the living quarters for the firefighters. And then above that is where the emergency operations center is going to be located. Again, just another view from the ground level. And uh, I'm just excited to see a 24-foot uh, red wall. I like red. And that, that number four is going to stand out, and you're going to know this is a Colleen fire station by all means, and so will anybody in the community when they're driving by. A different rendition at night, um, which I love just kind of seeing what it's going to look like when it's lit up uh, from the back, and it's going to have just a very good look and a, a good centerpiece for our city. This is as you now circle around clockwise, and that entrance where you see the cars is where the emergency operations center is going to be. And as we circle around, again, another nighttime view of the same uh, rendition a two-story lobby a, a grand lobby that when people walk into they know that they're walking into something special um, something that um, is really a feature piece of what the men and women of the clean fire department are deserving of and especially the citizens when the citizens come in or somebody from the outside comes in and it's not something like a, a bunch of connex boxes that were welded together now I applaud the men and women and the city for doing what we could do and making the best over the last 30 years prior, but times have changed and we're a big city, the 19th largest city in the state and we have to have a fire department and an emergency operations center and a training academy that trains our firefighters in a way that it shows us that is the 19th largest. This is the backside of the station. What you're looking at here is a two-story fitness center. Fitness is important, not only for physical fitness, but mental health of our firefighters. And all studies have shown that when you have a good fitness outlet to go to, even in the middle of a busy day, it's going to allow you to have just a little bit of stress relief, and it makes you more mentally prepared to either go on the next call or go home. And that's going to be open to the EOC personnel, fire station personnel, and the training academy personnel. And then the sports services building. Uh, one of the unique features of this building is going to be a three wide airplane hangar bay type feature. So we're not committed to just three bays that we can fit all of our trucks in there and there's not pillars in the way. And so that was something that's a unique feature. And then some of the ideas of the firefighters were when we go out for training, can we have some extra deep parking to put the trucks? So we're not trying to park them in a car parking space when we go out to do training because this is going to be a building that the public is going to be coming to. It is going to be holding training classes. It's going to be holding um, EOC training and emergency managers from around the state will be coming. So public is going to have access to this building as well. A shaded area. Who would have thought in the middle of Texas we need a shaded area for firefighters when they're doing their debriefing or pre-briefing before they go into the live fire training exercise. Uh, so uh, these are all ideas that were brought by the firefighters. And here are a few renditions of what the interior is going to look like. So something we're very excited about. It's very vanilla right now. We'll put some color into the interior, uh, very early stages, but very excited. And uh, we'll see what the bids come back with the construction companies in just a couple of weeks. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor.
Yes, so council, this will, the bid will be on our, uh, on your agenda pretty soon. And um, since we started this prices have skyrocketed, but we'll, we'll bring you a plan, some way to do this. And, and while the, the building looks amazing, if you really pay attention to it, it, it was done with a lot of economy in mind too, because these are a lot of metal type buildings that are, that are dressed up. Um, it looks awesome and I'm, I'm impressed, but I don't want, uh, I don't want you to think that uh, the designers went overboard on doing something uh, crazy expensive, but I think they did a great job making it look that way. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, now um, is our city engineer, is Andrew. Yeah. There he is. So uh, we're gonna get an update. Probably one of the things that people are most interested going on in town are uh, update on constru construction of some of our roads that we are at the end of their life and it's called remove and replace. That's the ultimate maintenance when you can no longer extend the life of the road and you got to tear it down and rebuild it. So, Andrew. Oh, okay, good evening. Uh, this is going to be just an update of the presentation I believe we gave council a couple months ago and obviously to the public. Uh, in the background, we back in 2021, 2022, the, there were a uh, CO bond that was passed to replace a few of the main roads that were deemed to be at a point where you had to replace them. So that included Gilmer, Shaw, Watercrest, Willow Springs, um, Bunny Trail, and also Stagecoach for obvious reasons. Uh, in addition, we had two other projects that we've added that are funded separately uh, that from the bond. That's going to be Chaparral Road and Ranseer. And where we are today, uh, Gilmer. So Gilmer Street is a replacing full replacement from Veterans Boulevard up to Ranseer. Uh, it is a full rebuild, so taking out the entire roadway, sidewalks, dealing with the railroad crossing, uh, improving the drainage, uh, and then we're going to be replacing it all, putting it up to current standards, addressing ADA, adding landscaping, and then also replacing that uh, railroad crossing, smoothing it out, and uh, updating all the gates, and then interconnectivity of everything. Um, that project is done with, con with the design and we're current, we went out for bid, we received bids and council will be seeing the bid award uh, early next month on that. And hopefully we want to start construction roughly around January of next year and I believe it'll be around a year, a little year and a half construction time frame for that. Watercrest is also completing its design. It is the full limits of Watercrest from Clear Creek over to Willow Springs. It is currently a four lane road. We are going to be narrowing it down to three lanes. We're gonna be adding sidewalks to the north side where there are none right now. Also redoing some of the drainage. We're gonna be adding a signal over at Robinette um, and essentially cleaning up the whole thing, putting that center turn lane, addressing some of the main traffic concerns we heard from the neighbors, and also the pedestrian safety and getting people and students over to the schools in that area. That design is completing. Uh, we should be wrapping up at the end of this year, going out for bid in January with construction starting spring of next year. Again, that may be about a year, year and a half uh, time of construction. Bunny Trail is uh, another project we are finishing up design. Uh, we've been to council, we did a preliminary, we've done open houses. Uh, that project, all we're doing is removing and replacing what's out there, and then we're gonna be filling in the sidewalk gaps where there are, trying to get a connectivity of the sidewalks. We're finishing the design, we're now looking at what easements we need for those sidewalks, but we are planning on putting this out for bid as well in January. Uh, with construction starting in spring, and it'll be about a year uh, time frame as well. Also included in this is, is fixing that drainage issue we have at the intersection of Stan Schluter and Bunny Trail that collects water. Uh, we have an agreement, we're working with TxDOT so we can actually get the pipe in the ground to, to fix that issue as well, and that's all in this one project. And there's another slide on explaining thing, but again, we're bidding in January is what our goal is. Willow Springs is tied to Watercrest, so we are actually putting this one kind of on that back burner because our emphasis is to get Watercrest out, get it under construction. Once that is done, we're going to be looking at when we can rebuild Willow Springs but, uh, based on funding. And we have only so much money in the bond, and then we're using our street fee to essentially build up the bank to uh, 
take care of the additional fees of all these projects that are going to cost. Uh, but this is the full limits of Willow Springs, including realigning the intersection with Watercrest. But right now there's an offset and we're going to straighten it out. We should be completing the, the, mostly the preliminary design by the end of uh, this year and then finishing, finalizing the rest of the design next year while Watercrest is under construction. Rancier is an interesting uh, project. It is actually part of that beautification. We're looking at redoing the character of that whole road, adding sidewalks, looking at undergrounding the utilities, adding landscaping, making it that entry corridor into the city. So it is the full length of the road that the city is under control from 38th all the way to the base at uh, VMB. And we are currently looking at getting to the preliminary design by the end of this year uh, to finding out what all our scopes are for the utilities, for this landscaping. We have a lot of issues with right away um, and seeing what we need to do, but that project is under design. We're hoping to be sort of working on the final design next year, finalizing it by the end of the year, and then coordinating on uh, looking for funds and also dealing with K-Tempo on the, the current grant we have and get this thing under construction and then hopefully really clear up and change that character of that area. And Stagecoach, uh, that is needing replacement. We have some obviously legal issues we're still in the middle of, but that is currently under design right now. We're looking at replacing that road and putting something that's going to last a little longer than this one has already. So we have a consultant, we've done the geotech testing already, we know what we're coming back with on the pavement section uh, based on our new standards that will hopefully last for a minimum of 20 years before we have to touch it. Uh, they are working on a, a, goal, a set of plans that will be based on when funding is available. So with the current projects of Gilmer, Watercrest, and Bunny Trail, that's spending a lot of the money, so we're having to have that bank account kind of fill back up. And then what we're going to do in our plan is with Stagecoach is to put it out in sections and try to get it as quickly replaced as possible based on the funding. And we are going the whole length of that from East Tremere all the way to 195 with starting on the East Tremere side. By the time we get to 195, there's a little bit of drainage issues we want to change up over there that kind of affecting the neighbors and that last subdivision there on the south side. And then Chaparral Road is the other one. Uh, we've had an open house already. We've gone through the preliminary design. We went to council, selected the, the alignment that we're going to be fully designed with. Our consultants are continuing to work towards that final design, looking at all the issues. Our one step right now that we have to go, the big hurdle is our environmental clearance. Uh, I don't know if many of you know that there is a endangered species of bird in the area and we've been told that we're going to be working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to create habitat for that bird as associated with this um, project, get those environmental clearances and then we can move forward with right away getting final design. It, since it is a TxDOT approval process, it does not go quickly. Uh, the environmental will probably take a year to year and a half and then we have to go to the next step. So likely we're looking at the soonest that we will be breaking ground will be the end of 2026, uh, 2027, depending on if we get enough funds to construct this project. It is a, a lot. We are applying for grants every year. Uh, we have one. Uh, pot, we haven't heard yet from another one yet, but we are still being aggressive and trying to find as many free dollars as we can for this thing. And again, this kind of continues what we're looking at with the 2027 for the start of that. And that's where we are on all our main projects. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. You can ask him back up there when it's over. Okay. Okay, and, and finally, Chief Lopez. He's already, there he is. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, and the citizens. Um, I just want to make one comment about that EOC building. It's a very nice building, but it, is, it needs a little bit of blue in it, so well, at least one pillar. All right. So tonight we're here to talk about um, the Real Time Crime Center, and just some presentations to inform you of, the, of this project and the benefits in establishing a Real Time Crime Center here in the City of Colleen. Um, a well-functioning Real Time Crime Center serves as a force multiplier. And for many law enforcement agencies 
enhancing our ability to protect our communities and respond to a wide range of incidents. I have to stress, this is just an introduction to bring in an RTCT, that's what we call it, Real Time Crime Center, to Colleen. Part of the process will be providing community with information about the Real Time Crime Centers because we understand there's some privacy concerns that we need to address and bring into the public and get their input before we do this. And tonight we have Mr. Gay, he's uh, one of the employees of the Fuse Technology. And if you have any questions, any technical questions, he'll be able to answer them at the end. This is our agenda. And the big thing I want to stress is that we have a very um, intense community engagement program so we can clearly explain what the real-time crime center really is going to do. And I think that's one of the big things that the community expects and we're going to provide that information. All right. Um, when we stand up a real-time crime center, this technology will allow us to have an integrated um, platform which puts our CAD system, which is a computer-aided dispatch system, our RMS, which is our report writing system, our AVL, which is our trackers in our vehicles, cameras stationed throughout the, the city on our red lights, and um, drones under one pane of glass, glass, which allow us to track all events instantaneously. Supervisors, classified supervisors will be able to uh, monitor the calls for service to ensure that the calls from citizens do not linger longer than they have to. A lot of the times we get a lot of complaints from citizens saying that it takes an hour or two for police officers to get there. With this system, it allows supervisors to have immediate visibility and recognize that, hey, this call has been holding for 30, 45 minutes and they could be able to dispatch a unit to that house. Um, employees will now be able to respond to calls for service with actionable intelligence. And when I say actionable intelligence, it means that instead of just driving to a residence on a disturbance, now they'll be able to get more information from the dispatcher. They're going to have the ability to call and FaceTime the, the citizen on their way to the call so they get more information. So when they get there, they realize is the mental health call, is it a domestic violence call, they'll be a little bit more prepared to handle the situation. And also, the real-time crime center with this software and this center is going to have the ability to send text messages to our citizens on when they should expect the police and what to do when we get there. So it's a very good program. Now we're going to talk about the benefits. And some of the benefits are faster response time, improved resource allocation, data-driven decision-making. So a supervisor will be able to understand, okay, if it's dispatched to only one officer got dispatched to a multi-car accident, it's going to need more units. So using this model, they will be able to dispatch more units so we could quickly clear the scene and give first aid to, um, to the citizens involved in the accidents and other incidents. Um, collaboration and information sharing. This is a great program because as we stand up the EOC, this is not program, it's not just specific to the police department. We'll be able to pass on that information to our members in the EOC and other law enforcement agencies and firefighter agencies around Killeen. It improve officer safety. It improves community engagement and trust. It reduces crime rates. There's been a lot of studies shown, especially in Chicago and other high population, high density areas, that crime rates are reduced by the use of um, using data-driven technology inside the real-time crime centers. And it's cost saving, you know. While there are initial costs associated with setting up and maintaining it, the efficiency gain throughout this process will help us save money, save time, and at the end, improve our community trust. These are other benefits. Currently, we have 123 real-time crime centers nationwide, and right now they're over eight in Texas. This industry and this technology is booming, and a lot of cities and communities realize the benefits of this technology. And the last one I think was set up was in Kyle, Texas, which is not too far from here. And we do plan to go visit with them to see how their center is set up before we even stand up ours. Now, the physical structure. This is going to be the most expensive part of, of, the, of the project, approximate cost. It was going to be 200,000, 400K. It's going to be housed at the police department. And the city of Killeen, our Department of Technology Services is aware of the project and understands we've been in communication with FUSIS. And initially, we're going to staff the, the real-time crime center 24 hours a day with two call takers and one classified supervisor. I have to make to ensure that, and I say it's going to take about a year to stand this up because it's not just standing up the building, the, the center, and then 
putting the software to work, we have to train our personnel to make sure that they know how to properly use all the elements of the software. And no funds have, to been, have been expended so far, but we anticipate bringing a cost to the council in January, February of next year, and um, hopefully we, we'll be able to get this approved and the citizens approve this program. Now we have to talk about the second component. Like I said, we have the physical component, which is $200,000, $400,000, and then we have the software, which is the brain of, of the, of the uh, real-time crime center. And using this software is going to allow us to integrate all those platforms, the CAD, body-worn cameras, in-car cameras, drones, license plate readers, all the traffic um, lights that already exist, so there's no additional cost to the city. We're using cameras that are already in place, so there's no additional cost. Department issue cell phones, city facility cameras, airport selected cameras, KISD in case we have to respond to a, um, to an active shooter event, any events on their schools. And I highlighted those last three things in red because the last three are privacy, privacy concerns and it's all voluntary. I don't want anyone leaving here thinking that we're going to have access to your cameras 24 hours a day. We could turn on the switch anytime we want because that's not the truth. You, as a citizen, as a business owner, as a resident, have the ability to say yes or no when we request you to, um, to tie into the Real Trump Crown Center. And you have to register. We can't just, you know, arbitrarily just go and pick your camera and sneak in. We can't do that. We don't have the ability to do that. And it's against you know, the law and the Constitution. Um, Fuses has been approved as a sole source vendor because they're the only ones that have the technology. That's already been, been established by the Department of Finance. So we move forward, we're probably going to use Fuses as our, as our vendors. And the next few slides are going to demonstrate the various components of Fuses. Fuses 1, it has, it's not just one technology, it's several pieces of technology layered on top of each other. And Fuses 1 is a map-based interface that allows me to see where all my officers are at all times. Fuses Ops, is, again, is going to allow police officers to send, to transmit their locations instantaneously to the real-time crime center so we can receive images, video, live as it occurs. Fuses Core automatically detects, and we're going to have video, I mean, a, a video in the, in the next few minutes It's going to explain all these components, but it automatically shows a map where all the authorized cameras are throughout the city, so in case we have a robbery, robbery say, at Shipley's, you know, we all, we like knowing that, so Shipley's is one of the things we always watch. So we have a robbery at Shipley's, and while units are in, are in route, the real time crime center could look at all the cameras in the area and just pick up data. Say the complainant says there's a black Ford truck that just robbed the Shipley's. We'd be able to scan the cameras in that area, identify it, and then pick up the license plates. It's not facial recognition, it just picks up objects and colors and license plates. So that's a good component. Um, Fuses Registry, um, excuse me, is, a, is again, is that you as a citizen have a right to register with us, and if you don't give us the rights to the camera, we won't have, to act, we won't have access to your camera. So please, I'm going I'm to make sure that you understand that. It's cloud-based, so there's no, no additional cost in buying servers for the city, so that's a great thing. Fuses Tips, if you're a citizen out there and you download the app and you, could, and you see a crime in progress, you can send us a tip anonymously. Via this app, you can send us text, video, pictures, whatever, and we receive that information and process it. And the, the thing I want to recognize the most is that last one, Fuses Live Link. It enables our 911 dispatch callers when an incident happens, especially in a mental health call or, uh, or domestic violence call or something that's in progress that's life threatening, the officer will be able to connect to the citizen via FaceTime and they could have a dialogue about the officers en route to gain more information. So this is very good, it's a very good program. And if I could show you a quick demonstration, it's about 30 minute video. No, it's only about three minutes. <laughs> so. <laughs> Welcome to Fusis, the industry's first cloud-based, rapidly deployable real-time crime center. Fusis integrates all major public safety technology investments into a single pane of glass, synthesizing real-time intelligence to enhance first responders' situational awareness and decision-making capabilities. Community-owned cameras are combined with video management software, drones, departmentally issued cell phones, gunshot detection systems, and license plate readers. 
All this information is integrated with the department's 911 dispatch software via a rules-based engine designed to ensure the real-time crime center lives in the hands of agency crime analysts and its field-based users. FUSIS brings intelligence to the field by operationalizing video. Officer locations in relation to a call for service, live video to and from their mobile devices, encrypted chat channels, embedded floor plans, and suspect video sent directly to responding officers contribute to the agency's capacity for critical incident management. Setting up FUSIS is fast, requires minimal hardware, and has no activation fees. You simply plug a FUSIS core into your existing camera or network, and within seconds, the video feed is analyzed, securely encrypted, and transmitted either by an ongoing live stream or on demand based on an alert. FUSIS AI at the Edge technology efficiently analyzes video right at the camera, saving precious moments by delivering an automated media payload based on the call for service. And unlike other systems, video and alert sharing is completely controlled by the donor location. For example, schools may choose to limit video sharing to emergency situations, like an active shooter event. And the camera itself can be shared based on the priority of the call, an associated sharing policy. In an investigation, police can automatically request footage from all nearby businesses at the click of a button. And camera owners can securely share recorded as well as live video feeds to aid in the investigation. Incident video and data is stored in a CGIS compliant vault for investigators. And additional video evidence is easily collected via a pre-configured camera registry map of all the public and private cameras in your region along with a multimedia tip line for the public. The FUSIS Real-Time Crime Center in the Cloud is a mission-critical hub that enhances the situational awareness and investigative capabilities of law enforcement agencies, keeping officers and community members safer. Okay, that's some brief demonstration I wanna talk about community engagement. I know there's been a lot of concern about privacy and big brother issues, and like I said, this, this system is voluntary. We have no authority if you don't grant us your authority to, to, actually, to add, um, access your cameras. But in order to alleviate some of those concerns, um, today we rolled out, if you look at our uh, Killeen Police Department Twitter and our Facebook page, we rolled out a survey in English and Spanish to allow community members to have some input into this program. Additionally, we're going to host two town hall meetings. The date is set is November 9th and the 16th to specifically uh, address any privacy concerns the city's um, community members may have. I don't have the locations yet, but we're going to push that out. But the dates is going to be November, November 9th and the 16th. And again, I stress, this is the voluntary program. Um, and the implementation is going to be, um, it's going to be staffed 24 hours a day. And we're going to train all personnel on all aspects of this whole field before we um, roll it out because we want to make sure we eliminate any bias. So, like I said, this is IA technology, but it's not facial, facial recognition technology. All it does is track objects, colors, and records license plates. And we'll be able to use that information to, you know, to quickly respond to incidents and then help some investigators reduce the investigative timeline. So say you had a burglary overnight, investigators now, they have to wait to the morning go canvas the area, find video. With this system, we'll be able to, with the train RTC center personnel, we'll be able to get all the videos within an hour, and then when the investigator comes to work, they have that information there and reduces the investigative timeline. And in summary, uh, real-time crime center is a vital component of modern law enforcement that leverages technology to enhance public safety, improve response times, and support effective decision-making um, process. So um, that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I think one thing to keep in mind, we have to do some things to get more efficient, to get smarter, because uh, the police officers you, you see in the room here, um, they're as valuable as gold. And it, with the um, even with the big improvements we've made in pay and benefits, we still haven't been able to make any progress um, filling our vacant positions. It's sort of two steps forward, two steps back. Uh, but just read yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the city of Austin needs to hire about 300 officers a year just to keep up with attrition. 
and they're hiring 30 to 40, uh, that doesn't work. So in comparison to that, we're a lot better, make you feel a little bit better about where we are. Um, but that situation is not going to change uh, anytime soon. Um, and we're going to keep working hard to be competitive to, to get those folks that we can to be police officers. But we've, we're continuing to grow. Um, the city's continuing to grow. And we, we've got to get we got to get smarter and more efficient. So um, we ne we have a few requests to speak, or if the council has any comments, they want to go first. Uh, we can let the residents go first. All right, the first one we have here, Bear Jones, uh, wants to talk about the road reconstruction. And if you, if you want, there's a microphone right there. Yes, yes, sir, right. I, I got you. Oh, okay. I don't need a microphone. Oh, you're right. I forgot about I that. Okay. <laughs> sir, I know you got projects started and all that stuff. Can you give us a timeline, like when the Gilman uh, Project support to finish, and then and keep that updated like once a month on the, uh, the website or something. Mr. Bear, the. Excuse me, we have to have you on mic in order for they can be able to record you for the residents that's not here tonight. Thank you so kindly. Thank you, Councilmember Boyd. Can you hear me now? Okay, I start over. Can you figure out a timeline like when Gibbons supposed to be finished, then once Gibbons finished, you let them know this is the next project, just go all the way through it, about once a month, update it. For the citizen to know, like, they started complaining about Bunny Trail. <laughs> I got people that live over there always complaining. They say, well, you're due to get started December 2023. We know that's not possible, but the point is they have some type of focus. To say, okay, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. So I keep my mouth closed. Stop complaining <laughs> to your councilman. Because they have a timeline, they already know what you know. So everybody know, hey, it's coming. I got to be patient. Can you handle that, sir? Sure. Let me get up to the mic so they can hear me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we have on our website, on the engineering page, we have uh, a quick little graphic that shows the updates of all these projects. And in addition, we also have a report that we do every quarter that keeps up on every project we have in the city. So if you go onto our webpage and go to the engineering, we have those links and anyone can go see those and we do, re we do update those. And then as we get to the projects, we're gonna be updating our website as well to dive down more into those projects. So Gilmer will have its own little update on there and availability with schedule so that our project managers will be updating. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes, sir. You can. And uh, Condice? You, you can. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, City Manager. Um, of course, y'all already know I'm here to talk about the, comprehens the comprehensive plan. Um, and of course, in favor of everything that's going on with the downtown area, um, even listening to what Chief was speaking to, um, Chief Kabinsky was speaking to in reference to continuing to invest in the services has a direct play on the value of the property around us. Um, and so that money that you guys saw, that $9 million, so one, thank you all to the council members that put in for that ARPA fund um, and then just continue to support us as we continue to invest in our area. Um, I am kind of like the social media warrior when it comes to all the negative articles. Um, in theory, I think I've actually done three KDH uh, interviews today um, because I want to make sure that every time they post something negative about downtown, the negative posts that you guys are talking about, they're talking about not coming, it, you're actually keeping people from coming downtown because you're continuing the stereotype. But again, the numbers don't lie. We have 35 brand new businesses. I am one of the 15 in the historic business district. Not only did I get the ARPA fund that allowed me to get there, and a lot of y'all think that that ARPA, that ARPA fund money disappeared after one transaction. 
um, because of the, the lack of intention on investing into the downtown area. So to know that there are business owners who are intentionally investing their money into this area, it actually helps the rest of the city. So the city took federal money, and it was a literally kill two birds with one stone type situation. We have an area in our city that is actually pulling from um, the tax bracket of what the rest of the city has to make up the difference for. The bills are the bills, regardless. And so you have an area that's literally not generating any money, then it's hurting the rest of the city. And so if the city starts investing into that, then it actually helps alleviate the pressure of the continued increase of everything as far as our services are concerned. Um, and so you want your city to invest in your downtown area. And I'm saying that not on a selfish end, because yes, I'm enjoying this property value increase. Um, but it's on the fact because I invested in my area. Um, I'm ready to buy my second property. Um, and so the, the goal is to continue to grow. There's some negative feedback in reference to, you know, some of the older business building owners in the area. I feel like they, they kind of feel like city staff is bullying them. It's really not. I think a lot of the, for a lot of years, they've been getting away with uh, Jimmy Riggin stuff. Um, and trying to get kick the can down the road. Uh, so I want to thank you guys for your intentional investment in seeing this is what happens when you invest into the area as we continue to grow. We're looking at the numbers in the downtown uh, visitation um, visitors area. It's definitely helping as far as the business. So I would definitely say continue to come down to the downtown area see all the business owners. We have amazing businesses um, that are investing. Um, we're excited. Um, and then join a committee, join a board. I, I also sit on the downtown advisory committee. Um, and so we get to talk about the events and how do we continue to bring uh, attention and attraction to those areas. So what KFD is doing, what KPD is doing, that secures the quality of life in investing in the area. But then what they're doing to the downtown area, this is the only area with walkability. Um, and you're seeing a lot of progressive um, action in how many people are actually down here during the day. Sometimes I stand outside my door and I do a people count. Um, I'm also tagging cars with flyers and so please don't drop them on the ground. Just come bring them back to my office if you don't want them. Um, but be intentional about your business. If you are in the downtown area, you still have to do business. Don't think that because there's people there that if you don't operate your business, if you don't know how to market, if you don't know how to invest, if you don't know how to advertise, if you don't have to be in front of people, you're not going to succeed. And so I continue to speak um, very loudly about the support I have. Again, not just on a selfish, hey, this is my business and I'm down here, but I am a, I'm a native clean. And so I get to see what intention and growth um, and owning, like being a true stakeholder, like that's a really cool thing. Um, and so our generations are going to continue to see what um, working and building really looks like. And so I appreciate you guys. And that's kind of all I have to say. Sean Price. Good evening. Um, I just had one question for the chief about the uh, program for the uh, setting up the uh, RTCC three program. It, my question is, is that I, I saw it kind of answered a little bit about how they're going to store the data, but who has the ability to edit that data and who is going to manage that data? Um, I do take issue with police having specific cameras to surveil the area. I understand the drone, the drone method gives them certain tactical advantages. Uh, I live in a high crime area. Um, and I, they, so I'm not really too adverse to the, uh, uh, to the sky cams, if you will, right? Or using traffic cams, that's kind of like a no brainer. And I, I have cameras on my house, so I would offer them for the police at any point in time because I got plenty of vagrants in my yard and stuff like this. That's always the case. They can have access all they want, right? I don't really care. Um, but it's just that, that ability, if the, any one of them have the ability to edit, cut off, manage any of the data, as long as it's, it's there, it's complete, um, and you can, uh, the, the forensic stamping, if you will, is um, obvious. 
Um, and I, was, I didn't know if it, we would have the actual ability, if we signed in, that the public would have the ability to view the same cameras, such as you can do on uh, TxDOT. I'm not sure if that would be in this case, because it's, it's criminal. That's a lot of questions. Let me see if I get the first one. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, I forgot to mention that this is not going to be a 24-hour surveillance, but we're going to have police officers, like, Watch the cameras. It's going to be incident-based driven. So when we get a 911 call, um, we will get we will activate the cameras in that area and then respond to the incident. Um, what was your other question? Edit edit, edit capabilities. Um, and Mr. Gabe, I can ask you to to address that. I don't know about the technical capacity, but that's why I brought you along. <laughs> How you doing, Mayor and Council, City Manager? One thing, I retired from Austin, so I know they're hurting right now. Absolutely. Um, in reference to the editing, no, is the way the terminology is today, all the stuff the city has is they have the wherever they're going to store it. So our particular solution is on a, on a store and forward. So even if you have access to, let's say, a gas station for a particular situation, is that that data r stays at the gas station. It doesn't reside. And there is an agreement, like just like today, if a police officer went and said that there was a crime that took place, they would ask for the video and then pull the video. What it does is there's agreement saying is that the only time the police would actually access and record and get that is only for evidentiary purposes. So the video itself is always, it's, it, it cannot, it's encrypted. And so it cannot be changed. It's all data stamped. So, and it, it is whoever owns that, that storage, it stays that person. So it doesn't become the city's at any time unless it's for evidentiary purposes. Does that answer your question, sir? Well, I was more concerned of the city's data, right? The one that they're, you know, the city cameras, the city surveillance cameras. Who has the ability to edit that data? Because my personal stuff, I, you know, I get it. I can, I can edit that, but, you know. Um, it's more what the public doesn't have access to on, on a daily basis. So who's... Correct. Who's that would probably be a city IT question because, like, we're not going to actually do anything with the city IT data. Is that we're just... the Our, our platform just puts it all together and integrate it, like Switzerland, of, of making sure it's easily accessible. Go ahead, sir. So to answer the, the your question, sir, for the, the city cameras, the... Uh, Traffic cameras are not recorded at all. They're view only. Right. right. Building uh, or facilities that we have, they're recorded, but only for a, a certain amount of time. Access is granted by a privileged basis. Uh, so most nobody in the city has it. Uh, IT staff, we pull the video and they get a copy of the video is sent to the, uh, the police, police department so that they can do whatever they, they need to do with it. But the original data also stays in our storage uh, that we have, and that's, that's on, and, on site. But nobody has the ability no. to edit it, right? No, they have no because ability like to edit it. the jail, all the cameras there, they can't edit it. They they, can only they, look those at systems it only, yeah, and it's, and it's a privileged basis, so, so only certain individuals even have access to the cameras. Okay. Certain people have access to to pull the camera data on, and that list is very small, and we, we audit that list to make sure who is the appropriate person. Uh, there's only three people in PD right now that can actually do that. Yeah, and that's, yeah. yeah I just wanted to make sure that yep. the editing... Yep, that the editing always, is not... Always a question in my head when yep. I hear, heard the whole thing. was like, who or does anybody actually have editing, you know, to yep. manage to erase or delete or anything like this? No, the milestone systems that we use or the salient systems that we use, they all have um, metadata uptime to it. So you, anybody would know it was tampered if it was, if it was altered. Awesome. So. Perfect. And if I could add one more thing to the, when we download video evidence for evidence and the, <laughs> we give it to the Bell County Days office, all that metadata has to be the original data and it's going to show if there's any edits or anything like that. So. Well, we protect that and we make sure that. But that's great. That's a great question. And that's something more we're going to address when we have our town hall meetings concerning this on the November 9th and 16th. And I forgot to mention that the survey is available now, October 19th to um, November 17th. So please fill it out. 
Okay, and then uh, Bill Paquette. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad I showed up. I was really impressed with the presentations that were made. Um, people who don't keep up with what you are doing uh, on the dais have no idea the vision you have for advancing our city. All they know is you got a fee here, a fee there, my tax is going up. Someone's got to pay for it, and everyone is going to benefit from everything that we saw from the police chief, our fire chief, and um, for uh, Mr. Zagers there, getting these roads where they need to be. It's a huge investment of time, energy, uh, but it needs to be done, and everyone is going to benefit from it. Uh, before I even came down here, I uh, uh, spoke with Miss Kate about the downtown area, and uh, I moved here when I was eight years old, so I've been on and off, and that's more than a few years ago, and um, downtown was all that we had. Uh, Highway 190 slash I-14 wasn't even a thought at the time, so everything that you needed was in a very small area. I had no complaints. I was a kid, you know, so my needs were simple. But I was disappointed as the city grew, everything moved south and everyone forgot about downtown. And as a result, uh, you know, went into uh, decay. And uh, I am glad to see the effort that is going into making it what it was one time before. And Ms. Kate said, I would be glad to give you a tour of everything that's been done. Because um, for the longest time, I really wasn't all that interested, but uh, through your efforts, I am very curious to see, you know, the results of your labors and your passion. Uh, so I just want to say, I'm glad I came to this meeting. Thank you again. And that's why I support you folks so adamantly and our staff members because it is a collab uh, collaboration between you know your ideas and their ability so thank you again i believe that's all the speakers that we have signed up yes sir so thank you um i wanted to open it up uh, Ms. Kegel, would you open it up to see if any council member, starting with uh, council member board, if he would like to speak and move to yes, uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez at the end. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'll just be real brief. Um, as representative for District 4, uh, my focus just remains on uh, roads and parks in particular. Uh, we made progress on uh, two community parks. I believe we have planning that's going to be going on at some point. Uh, we established some funding. And so uh, that's an ongoing deal. Um, those are the only updates that I have. Thanks. Council Member Cigara. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here and for those that spoke. And um, I just want to say that uh, yesterday I had a cup of coffee at a Starbucks. And guess where that Starbucks was? Rancier. That's it. And a lot of people, to me, that's a big thing. That is a huge thing. They took the, uh, they they trusted us to invest, put a brand new building there on Rands here, and that's a project that we as council members are going to be looking at. But that is, uh, you know, hopefully have the domino effect to attract, you know, more people because they've always said it's the foot traffic that we need. We need businesses that can bring more foot traffic to help support all our other businesses. And so I think it's a big thing. We need to look at ways that we can continue doing that. Because I know on Rands here, we do have a lot of old buildings still there. And uh, some of them, just like what they did, I think it was, uh, was it a Long John Silver that was there, right? Yeah. Boarded up for a long, long time. And they came and they tore that building down. And so that's the kind of things that, as council members, we need to look at. Uh, tearing down these old buildings, getting new buildings, because I don't know when the last time a new building was built up in Rance here. That's why I think it's a big thing. And so I think that, um, you know, with your efforts, with the people that are really taking the risk, you know, you guys that are downtown 
have invested and understand that it is a risk to go down there. And you, 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 you've taken that on, understanding. We need to do what we can to try to support you. And I don't mean just giving money, because that sometimes it's the, what you need is, as I always said, you need people to come in that door. That's the important thing on any business. You gotta have foot traffic coming in. And so I think that as a city, we're trying to do that, you know, create those events. We need to continue uh, putting events down there and uh, go on from there. Now, the other thing, and I think that, um, who was it, the, the police chief? There he is. And when you talked about the building, because I, I did have an opportunity to visit the Fort Worth. They have a, a phenomenal uh, building out there. And um, they even have one of those mobile vans and that was out there that they park. But when you said the building was 200 to 400, I thought that was a typo. Because <laughs> that is extremely low. I was expecting millions. When I went down there, it was millions. And if it's two to 100 to 400, me, and I'm speaking for myself, let's do that thing tomorrow. You know, we, we, you know, we just gave a center 350,000, which is important. Yeah, but if we can do a center for two to 400,000, we need to put that on short agenda here coming up. And so, so, cause that's an important issue for citizens, you know, crime is, and so we need to tackle that as quickly as possible. But uh, again, thank you all for being here and uh, for being part of this. We do, I do appreciate it, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Cobb. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you for your patience. And most importantly, thank you for your ideas. So many times people say that we don't hear you. We do hear you. We may not say nothing behind you, but we hear you and know that it's important. Know that you are important, our community is important, and the things that are taking place. I'm in awe. I can't wait. You all know I'm the impatient council member. I want to see everything the next day. So just wait with me, and I tell you, look what's coming. Thank you for coming tonight. Councilmember Solomon. Well, I'll say the same thing. I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight. It's, uh, this is my first town hall meeting, uh, and uh, it's been a good one. I, th I want to you know, give kudos again to the staff and to, to, bringing, to making this city move forward in a real way, and, and we're staying on track, as the Madam Mayor had mentioned, and she started out with the uh, 2040 comprehensive, pl comprehensive plan, and um, I'm excited about that, and uh, we, are, we are moving forward, and uh, I'm in, I am the City Council Member of District 2, and um, I just like uh, council member board, uh, I am on the roads in the park because uh, the roads and parks in that area because um, stagecoach is really needed and I'm glad to hear the progress of what's going on. And with that and with our parks and um, 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 with the trail park, I had a chance again to uh, be with some of the uh, staff and to the uh, departments, like I said on Tuesday, and, uh, and to see the progress and the vision that they have, and even with the city par parks. And so uh, it's, it's good to be in a city that's moving forward and to be and to see the staff. I want to say the staff is just, staff is it's awesome. And uh, it's, uh, they are the engines of this city. And yes, we do a lot of things. We make a lot of decisions, but they are the ones that carry it out and uh, they are the wheels. And so I, I just want to say thank you and thank you all uh, citizens for making it possible also. Thanks for coming out. Councilmember Gonzalez. I second that motion. Um, in District 1, there's a lot of special projects. I will be brief, but I want you guys to get excited with me, first of all. So I want to first start by saying thank you to my champions, the road dogs, the people that are holding it down, that understood the vision of what we were trying to accomplish here in the city of Colleen. So as Mayor uh, Pro Tem Cobb mentioned, we heard you, because when I was running for office, I didn't start out with a platform that was my points of what I thought I wanted my city to be. I'm from here, born and raised. But I sat out there and I talked to the constituents. I talked to the citizens. I said, what do you want to see? What do you want to have happen? How can I help? And safety was number one. Thank you. 
Thank you to our police department. Thank you to our engagement unit. We can check that. It's work in progress, but we are making improvements, as you've seen and heard. Fire department, help those people out. Check. You're welcome. Those trucks, they're beautiful. We're doing tremendous jobs working with other neighborhoods. We've done that. We should be excited and proud about our city of a clean as a whole. And to our constituents' point, when one part of our city is doing well, all of the other parts then will continue to succeed. So going down our list, I want to start with downtown on my special projects really quickly. So the mayor touched on it, but I just want to go a little bit deeper. Um, and Ms. Kate has been keeping track since she got on um, coming into this process. The traffic, foot traffic, how many people are coming downtown? I was told that it's a dead horse, it's a waste of time, there's no point in investing any money down there. I said, well, I've got a vision and I've got some people who have been there for a long time who are running businesses who are very passionate about it. So Kate started tracking this early on. Foot traffic, 600,000 uh, in her first, uh, first year. This 12 months, we are at 1.2 million. Can I get an amen, please? That is awesome. That's in one year. So it just goes to show that all of the money that we are not throwing at downtown, that we are strategically placing in this particular environment is actually working. Mayor touched on the $9 million in reinvestment um, into our downtown area. Kate went a little bit deeper with that. And so for the reinvestment of the $9 million, uh, every dollar that the city of Colleen put in, we had a return on investment of $10. Can I get an amen and a heck yeah, that's awesome. That's wonderful. We also touched on the jobs. So 87 new jobs in that particular area. Um, while it might not sound like a lot, this is again, is a huge strategic move. This is progress, right? So 87 new jobs, 37 downtown, 15 in the historic district. We've got new businesses down there that need foot traffic, and guess what? It's coming. We've got other businesses that are opening, people that are signing up and signing on. And on top of that, we've got our courthouse annex, uh, thanks to the county that is going to be rebuilding a very beautiful 27,000 square foot building uh, in the center of our downtown area. And they've got some uh, good design and progress. They're still working on their, bless you, they're still working on their details, but it's gonna be a beautiful addition to our aesthetics downtown and also um, helping with that walkability. Um, according to a presentation that was held by County uh, Commissioner uh, Louis Minor last night, uh, the estimation for this annex is to be completed by 2025, a projection of 400 jobs, $10 million on this uh, just construction alone. But furthermore, it's gonna create job opportunities, subcontracting opportunities for our contractors here in the Bell County area. This is gonna create new business opportunities, new jobs, but then also for my businesses that are there in downtown and also coming, foot traffic. They are estimating 500 daily visits in that particular area alone. When people come down there, they're gonna to wanna to eat, they're gonna need a place to drink, and after work, they're gonna need a break from all that hecticness throughout their day, and they're gonna to wanna to relax. So there's opportunity for all of us um, in that particular um, arena. Some of our other special projects, I'll just go really quickly, is Anthem Park. Super, super stoked about this. If you're not familiar with it, please look it up online. It's a 200-acre mixed-use development. So if people heard about Dave & Buster's coming to our area, we've been fighting. There's nothing to do in Colleen. We need some more things. There's lots of things to do here. You just have to find it. But Dave & Buster's, um, it looks like they are going to make a commitment to come to our area. What does that tell us? That tells us that we are a viable city. We've been told that we are the 19th largest. I've been preaching that we need to start acting like it and we need to start commanding um, that our, that our presence in this particular arena. And so thank you to those organizations that are seeing that globally. Thank you for watching us and thank you for coming. So this is gonna be a huge deal because that's also gonna bring mixed use retail opportunities for our city. So people are asking for jobs, where are they? They're coming, they're here and they're coming. So job opportunities, improved living opportunities, entertainment opportunities, <laughs> And if you're starting a business, this is more quality retail space for you, right? So these are all great things that are happening right there in District 1, but here in our city of Colleen. Um, also, uh, Fire Chief uh, Siddons Martin Emergency Group has now joined the Central Texas market. What does this mean to you? So with our fire department, they were having to send their vehicles out for repairs and services. And Mr. Cagle mentioned about how we need to start working more efficiently and smarter with our time and our dollars and being more, more uh, better stewards of our time and our dollars. Um, having this particular organization locally in our business park, that's an active business park. So if you're listening, please check it out. There's a lot going on in that business park, despite popular belief. This group is coming here and they're gonna be the leaders, they're leaders in responding to the needs of any first responders, emergency vehicle needs. So instead of having to send those vehicles out, 
they can service them right here in our backyard. That is huge. So we're thankful for them for saying yes to the city of Killeen. Also, Dong Jin Semi Kim. This company is out of Seoul, Korea. They've been around since 1967 um, internationally. They opened their first plant. They're a subsidiary of Samsung, right? So while we didn't get a lot of the big plants and we didn't get a lot of the big corporations initially that we thought we were missing out on, we were able to pick up some of the, the offshoots of those, the subsidiaries that are helping um, in those. So Dongjin is one of those. It's a, this is a very big deal. They're here with us now. They opened their first plant in the United States of America in the city of Killeen. Can I get an amen and heck yeah? This is great. So this is, this is wonderful. So we have a lot to be proud about. So I just want to remind everybody when we are looking and you want to know what's going on in the city of Killeen, let me just say first we're open for business. We are professional. We are transparent. We are deserving and we are commanding the fact that we are prepared to grow our city. We are doing what we need to do to take care of our first responders that take care of us. And we are ready to continue on our journey to grow this city um, and to make us clean on the map number one, even though we're falling right at 19. Lastly, you guys talked about roads, so I won't, I won't go there, but um, we know what's going on there. Sh um, shelter update, the 350K, the stipulations are up of hope. We're working with our nonprofits. I just also want to say that I'm very proud of the fact that um, when I first came on, we were uh, challenged with communication in our city. Everybody was working in silos. Um, we are no longer doing that. The city is awake. Our people are, are connected. We've got champions that are now not only in tune with the vision, but they're actually speaking on it. They're, they're supporting us, supporting our city. We are going to grow and we are going to go. So I just want to tell you, thank you. There's a lot more happening in the city of Colleen, especially in District 1. If you want to know, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to chat with you about it. But thank you. That's all I've got. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez. Thank you. And that will lead into one more last thing. Uh, she gave you an update on things that have transpired during our council meetings, which are on Tuesday at 5 o'clock p.m. right here in this chamber on Tuesday night. On the fifth Tuesday, we really try not to have a council meeting because, you know, we want time off, but sometimes we do have to have a special meeting on Tuesday. And if you also go on our website, www.colleentexas.gov, you can also find all these updates on our website. And the most important thing that I wanted to leave with um, before we leave, adjourn to leave, <coughs> I guess we don't have to adjourn. We didn't vote on it yet. To uh, talk about the grocery store on the north side of Colleen. So last night, if you attended the council meeting or if you go back and look at our video that's on www.colleentexas.gov, you will see a presentation that was done by Ronnie Russell. He's the Innovation Back Black Chamber president. So he was talking about our um, Oasis market and we're at the point where KEDC is involved. They took a trip down with Mr. Russell and other individuals to see the market. Mr. Cagle is involved because we're trying to work on the wording for a letter of intent. So that is moving forward. Also, um, we have not brought this to the public yet because we're still in negotiation <laughs> with this one. We have another grocery store opportunity. Um, Mr. Cagle and Councilwoman Gonzalez and I have been talking to um, some more investors on bringing a uh, grocery store. And I want to say this, we don't, we, we're just in the, we met probably Four, t three or four or five times uh, and right now we're waiting on them to give us a letter of intent and and see uh, what we can negotiate together and I hear all the time that people say we're not trying to bring a grocery store on the north side of town but this second one is a potential and I don't want to get anybody hopes up because like I say we met three or four times and some challenging conversations but also to bring in urgent care uh, along with the grocery store. It will be a combined uh, uh, facility. And I don't want you to get your hopes up high, but we are trying to really work hard 
to bring a grocery store in the downtown Colleen. We have not brought KEDC into it because we're still trying to find out if this is even feasible. So uh, you may not see us talking about a lot on the dais, and that goes from each individual council member. But trust me, they are blowing up the city staff phone, and especially Mr. Cagle. And I don't even know how long our assistant city manager going to be here when she realized how demanding this council right here is, because they have high expectations. And they shoot for excellent. And we have the staff that can go beyond that. And that's also our employees. So we're always working on your best interest. And one more time, it's www.colleentexas.gov if you want to know, have any updates on what's going on in the city of Colleen. And our council meetings are on Tuesday and this chamber at 5 o'clock p.m. Do any of the council members have any alibis before we go home? Okay, thank you. Mr. Cagle, the floor is yours. I, I think you can adjourn the meeting. Uh, all right. We didn't call it, but everybody have a great, great night, and thank you all for coming out. <laughs>